Greetings, friends. We hope you are out there and can hear us. And welcome to our Circle of All Nations January 17th New Year gathering. And let me start with Grandfather William Commander. It's a non American. Je suis pas indien, mais je viens, je viens pas des Indes. Alors, euh, l'Amérique, Nord-Amérique, oui, c'est moi. Nord-Américain. Bonjour, Grandfather William. Bonjour, Grandfather William. Bonjour, Hello, I can see that um, Dilara is there, so I know someone can hear us. And please confirm if there are any uh, problems with hearing me. And welcome then to the Circle of All Nations presentation on the legacy work of Indigenous Elder William Commander. And uh, <clears throat> here's some little background information about me and about our work. And those of you who have already heard about our live video will know basically what our agenda is about today. Um, and I'll just run through it briefly. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we witnessed the most special geocosmic moment with the dawning of the age of Aquarius, with the alignment of the planets Jupiter and Saturn for the first time in 800 years, uh, indicating that we were moving to a new position in the concept, uh, uh, celestial dome in the cosmic universal um, portion of the galaxy that we belong with, within the Milky Way. A very special moment that uh, friends like, uh, like uh, William Sullivan, who wrote this book on the secret of the Incas, uh, alerted us to and alerted us to the tremendous knowledge of the ancient people of these cyclical moments in the Earth's um, uh, process of journey uh, around the Milky Way. And while we're not so much focusing on that level of uh, geocosmic uh, knowledge and information today. We really wanted to acknowledge this special time because those of us who are familiar with the work of Grandfather William Commander will know he is very much inspired by the prophecies of his ancestors and in particular the Seven Fire Prophecy which implied that times of change were upon us and he worked uh, very, very hard from 1987 and increasingly over the last 20 years of his life to awaken us to the urgency for transformation in our relationship with Mother Earth, with the geocosmic Mother Earth, with acknowledgement of the cosmic uh, in the lives of us ordinary folk down on Earth. Um, and uh, um, now, of course, we're all at a major crossroads in relation to the two things that Grandfather Commander uh, taught us was very important, our relationship with Mother Earth and our relationship with each other. And uh, uh, we're, we're here to, to learn from and affirm 
uh, the, the trajectory that he positioned many of us into in his circle formations work. So over the course of this upcoming year, we plan to offer to, uh, live videos in the middle of the month to focus on some of the themes that Grandfather Commander thought was very important. And today, for the beginning of the new year, uh, following the very special uh, new moon of uh, January 13th, which ushers in this new period post the uh, December solstice, uh, the period when light returns to us. We're talking a little bit today about the ideological foundations that contribute to supporting the, the thinking and the work of the William Commander uh, effort. So from a kindergarten dropout to an honorary and research indigenous PhD, uh, we're for, talking about build, bridge building and bridge bridging relationships and knowledge generation amongst indigenous, grassroots, non-government organizations, governments, academics, and the corporate structure in a globally connected world in under unprecedented crisis. The theme for the online gathering is building bridges and creating hope and community in a world on fire and in global isolation linked with William Commander's work, Seven Fire Prophecy, his prayer for Gina Wei Daganuk, and the indomitable laws of nature in life. What we're hoping to do is create a global blueprint for an inclusive journey forward, individually and collectively. And we ask, is this possible? And because Grandfather Commander worked till he died, we know he believed it was possible, and so we continue. Um, so I'm wanting now to, to uh, say that we're going to be showing this image that was created, I'll go back to it in a second, for gr grandfather's uh, birthday. And, um, and because I've had so many questions about it, I've uh, decided to explain it a little further. And in fact, really what I consider it just now is our Ojibwanam prayer. As many of you know, I'm not indigenous. Uh, I met Grandfather Commander in 1997 and have supported his work since then. And it's always a challenging uh, um, matter to, to both uh, engage in the indigenous prayer and the, 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 the ceremonial um, practices that, that he introduced us all to. And as you know, we were not able to smudge during the last eight years when we hosted meetings at the Public Service Commission building. Um, but of course, that was always the way grandfather greeted people, uh, opened his meetings, welcomed people to his own home and welcomed people to my home. Uh, which is where I'm sitting right now. And, and so I want you to know I'm, um, I'm respecting uh, the prayer uh, that he inspired in me and in many others with the smudge and with the feather. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, other elements in the ideological foundations that we saw reflected in the way grandfather did his work and did his life and did his com communications. We'll talk a little bit with some of our Circle of Four Nations colleagues around these themes with uh, a student uh, a little later and then with those of you who who join us from the chat box and uh, perhaps we'll have our guest from uh, uh, Manitoba joining us as well. So this then is the image that I wanted to talk a little bit about. This Ojibwa Nong prayer image was created for Circle of All Nations by architecture student Mudurin Murugatasan, uh, a student at Carlton University. 
Anne, may I say many thanks to Dominic uh, Cote for the French translation of the text. So you see, we now have the image available in, in both the English and French. And uh, this is the text of the, um, the, the microscopic explanation of the, the prayer. And later, I elaborate on the conceptual image further in the densification of its meaning. And thus, we hope to reach a diversity of people through image, through words, through language, and through elaboration. And so this is a William Commander legacy, a circle of all nations geocosmic prayer and reflection. The iconic symbols in the image are, are of importance to William Commander's worldview are incorporated. Um, Grandmother Moon and the Morning Star, invoking the spirit of fire, enlightenment, and cosmic. Asin and the sleeping giant, commemorating earth creation in the rock. Air, wind, movement animating water life, emergent from the oxygen rocks of the Kitchissippi Ottawa River. The birch, the wolf, the eel, and turtle, honoring evolution, plant and animal life, Turtle Island and the canoe. Um, and they acknowledge the ultimate nurturer, Mother Earth, symbolizing the enigmatic journey of life. When uh, I was questioned about this image, uh, uh, in particular by an, a friend of ours who's an astronomer, um, I thought of explaining more of the elements uh, to him and then really actually to more of us. So I should say, you know, Madhuran is a, a relatively new uh, student to indigenous uh, uh, studies, as well as to the work of William Commander and the Circle of All Nations. But he's a very creative uh, as person. And I asked him to create a graphic that conceptualized uh, key elements in the William Commander work. And uh, he presented this very, um, a beautiful image and um, and it incorporates uh, the, 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 the key items that I just been uh, sharing. But when I was asked to think about it a little bit more, I said, well, this is where some of this uh, image takes me. The geocosmic acknowledgement prayer is inclusive of many things I learned from grandfather, as well as from my own reflections. It's grounded in geocosmic principles. It is embedded in images of importance to understanding the core elements of William Commander legacy and his Jinawe Daganuk, everything is interrelated prayer and key priorities, and is intended to be animated at relational and reflective levels. It orients one to the geocosmic time, space, motion dynamics of the solstice, the equinox, the eclipse, the day, the night, the fall, new moon, items that Circle of Four Nations has prioritized formally in its events and gatherings uh, since 1998. Mekinak Turtle points to Turtle Island which is what indigenous peoples have called North America since time immemorial, and to water earth interconnection. And you would remember in the earliest of our uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations, maybe two decades ago, uh, we would show images of the turtle and maps of North America, which uh, uh, reflected the, the shape. And we always wondered how uh, the, the, the ancient people knew that turtle was the, 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 the image that reflected their land base, so special. Manash Kadosh, the ancient eel, represents the evolutionary principle of life and, of course, the endangered species that we've been um, uh, concerned about uh, since 2004 with the um, formerly 
2002 it might have been, with the Species of Risk Act, which grandfather blessed when it was launched in Canada. The, uh, um, the image incorporates the key elements, fire, Ishkote, by the Ojigwanong and Tibetesis star and moon, and morning star. It incorporates earth, Arctic, via rock, including the sleeping giant rock formation in Lake Superior in my stylized photo, and rock in the water representing the oxygen rocks of the Kitsipi River. And here I have for one to show you the earliest spores that um, resulted in the creation of oxygen uh, uh, embedded in some of these ancient, ancient rocks. And many of these rocks are found very close to Ottawa. In fact, uh, as some people would call them, used to call them the fairy lo uh, rocks. And uh, you'll know uh, folk from Ottawa that just across the river from, from where I am in Canada, there's the Lac de Fee area. And uh, in the earliest stories of the newcomers um, meeting the indigenous peoples, they would see these uh, fires across the, the land. And really, Native people were hosting many sweat lodge ceremonies and making sacred connection with a very important part of the land and a place where um, uh, oxygen generating rock creation happened, very important principle for principle of life. And water, of course, uh, the NEP in the image is stylized to, uh, to imply the syntropic quantum physics feature embedded in water, where you can actually observe the, 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 um, the universal law of life, really, uh, evidenced in water. Um, and of course, the wind, Nodin, in the wave on the water. The image includes uh, plant life in the birch, uh, in the birch bark frame, animal life in the wolf, also the mythic bridge between the human and animal worlds, the psychic cosmo connector, and also representative of our Wolf Award project, which honors people and organizations that promote racial harmony. It represents, it incorporates the human embedded in this geocosmic world, which sustains as Mother Earth, Kichimani Aki, is the ultimate provider for all, and the canoe commemorating William Commander, a world-renowned canoe maker and his ancestry, and his Mami Winini body in motion identity and the mysterious journey of life. We are mindful of the tragic challenges of the COVID pandemic and the violence in North America at this precise moment. Grandfather Commander alerted us to this eventuality consistent with his responsibilities as the carrier of the Seven Fires Prophecy publicly from 1997 and ceaselessly till his death in 2001. We now have an unprecedented global crisis and we still don't see what is staring us in the face. A global shift in consciousness is desperately needed. And with these monthly Facebook Live video events, Circle of Four Nations commits to animate the William Commander legacy. We are yet to see anything more comprehensive and simple. But we are all needed to birth a culture of peace and a legacy of hope. I want to, uh, to say a little bit then about the ideological foundations of our thinking. And we're sharing some thoughts and ideas here because uh, what uh, we believe grandfather did was awaken each one of us individually to find our authentic voices. And as we found our voices, as we struggled to find our voices, so we became important parts of the Circle of All Nations tapestry that he was creating, a tapestry that is still really in the process of making. And as I've mentioned, uh, one student already, but later in the program, I shall have things to share about a few other students, which show that 
young people who, uh, who didn't know Grandfather Commander at all have expanded their thinking, haven't been exposed to some of his thoughts. So um, here we're talking about uh, things that uh, were critically important for him, the relationship with nature. In our Circle of All Nations work, we say, Grandfather William Commander built bridges with folk not rooted in his homeland, North America, in order to introduce them to his mother, Mother Earth, and to inspire relationship with her. He, he saw that many people had left behind their sacred relationships with their earth, their places of birth, their ancestral homelands, and he believed that they needed to be reconnected with a live Gaia, a living Mother Earth, so that they would not see her merely as a resource to be exploited. Drawing and writing are innate human impulses, as is mapping, and we are bodies in motion. Each of these animates our brains. And nature is the great exfoliator and releaser of new ideas, thoughts, knowledge, and evolution. I began to understand this uh, at a very deep level when Grandfather Commander got me a kayak and insisted I go out onto the lake to learn about water, to learn about nature. And as I gradually engaged in that, um, I really found I was getting cleverer. Nature was contributing to it. A, a deepening in my thinking. And I densify that learning through drawing, through taking photographs, through writing about it, and gradually uh, um, understood at a much deeper level what he was trying to teach many people. Many people have already understood this from him, but many others haven't had the great opportunity to learn so intensely. And this is why I'm taking a few moments with this to share this with you. Um, it also includes ideas that I myself evolved and developed both together with grandfather and even before him and separately. And together, they, they provide me with a great deal of strength during this period of unprecedented crisis. And I'm convinced it will also be the same for most others. Talk about art and the access and the release in the sharing of the creative view. So here we say the simple way is to find a leaf or a branch or a shell, piece of driftwood, pick up a pencil, piece of paper, and draw. Draw every detail primarily by looking at the item from nature. Uh, I've included the, the, the references of a couple of books that I found pretty insightful over the years. And actually what I'm going to be doing later is, is copying this uh, annotated uh, agenda and including it in, in the post lines so you'll be able to access this uh, better later if, you, if you're interested. But that is one of the simplest ways of beginning to develop your own relationship with nature, a very simple, personal way. Self-reflection. Grandfather Commander used to say to people who were in deep pain, Go and sit by a rock or a tree or by the water, supported by nature, engage in deep reflection. Deep reflection about forgiveness and things that hurt you. Reflection about planning, about relationships. And, and, and uh, we complement that with saying journal regularly. We say journal three pages every morning and uh, allow your creative brain, your right brain to expose and explore all its ideas. What you'll find in the course of the rest of the day is the left brain organizes it and enables you to accomplish so much more than, um, than we're otherwise um, capable of doing. And it's really because we're encouraging both sides of our brains to, to work in better cohesion. Uh, when we talk about the drawing, it's accessing an imagistic uh, uh, um, stimulus, stimulant in the brain. So it's, it's really like, really like, especially right now when we're so isolated, we need 
so many things to keep us moving, keep our minds moving. And these are just wonderful uh, ways we can do this. Identity. It's important to spend a lot of time examining the multiple facets of one's identity in the search for the authentic you. Gender, race, culture, age, religion, education, our roles, interests, passions, our shortcomings. The, the, the journey is really uh, to get to know ourselves as best as we possibly can. Uh, storytelling is one of the ways to gain courage and confidence to voice and share your authentic voice. Both you and others will learn from it. The talking circles at grandfather's gatherings taught us that we have both the right and the responsibility to speak. And as he modeled with the eagle feather, only we can ensure that we speak our best words. So it's constantly a, an aspirational challenge as we engage with others in the challenges of life. Dreams. Use dreams to guide you to your authentic self. And I want to share a little bit of uh, 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 here that I extracted from a, a, a special book by Stace Michaels, uh, interpreterdream.com. And it's an introduction to dream interpretation. And basically what his key points were, and I've looked at several other dream books over, over time, and I've just found this really pretty interesting and pretty simple and accessible. So his key points are that we have our conscious and our unconscious selves. And it's our psyche that negotiates both, between both worlds and presents messages to us in our dreams. So we all know we have our, our, our conscious self in terms of our jobs we do, the work we are, what we express about ourselves. But we know there are many hidden thoughts, many unconscious thoughts, any hidden issues, as, as well as the, the, the items we don't share with other people. The psyche negotiates between these two zones, uh, as Daisy Michael says, in a very simple kind of way. And, um, and then presents messages in our dreams. So um, we're, we're, we're advised to check on the emotions during and after our dreaming. And uh, the intensity of our emotions alerts us to the importance of a message in the dream. Um, he suggests uh, that we extract a one-liner from the dream. So we're just following the plot line of our dream. And then work to align that one line, a story line, with one's life realities, considering issues of dissonance and projection, pointers. Um, and, and so here we're really looking at instruction and guidance from the psyche. Okay, so basically the idea then is in a dream to just get the basic story. Then he points out that we dream in pictures. So we need to translate the images with respect to meaning as symbols. And these are, uh, are the bridge to the detailed interpretation of the dreams. And many dream books will give us ideas about how to interpret that or our own lives and our own experiences will guide us in that direction. And then the point of the dream is it's, it's given you a message. So look for ways to, to, to act upon the guidance of our psyches, bridging between our conscious and unconscious selves. The collective unconscious holds larger level of universal symbols and is another level to the dream interpretation. And I'm not really, really going there now, but I do want to, to mention that because you know what? I want to finish off this by saying, uh, individual dreams and our collective dreams are really, really very important. And in 2000, the, the global world developed a vision for a, a culture of peace. The United Nations declared the, the 2000 um, a decade for a culture of peace. And as you'll recall, in 2001, we had 9-11. Um, and of course, uh, 
lives at all levels have been transformed since then. And the, the vision really was, was uh, became a vision for war, for defense, for, uh, and, and in fact, we've seen the ramifications in, in two decades of unprecedented violence, violence that we're practically becoming indifferent to because we see so much of it happening live on television. But the last few weeks uh, have woken us up to really the huge challenges between these two visions. And COVID and isolation and, and the global connection reminds us that it is really so critically important for us to realize, as grandfather and his ancestors did, that everything is interrelated, everything is interconnected. And uh, we have to find ways to bridge our differences to evolve a new vision for the future, a vision consistent with the evolution of Mother Earth. Now, the cosmic uh, reality presents us a shift in the, um, the ages. We're now moving into the age of Aquarius and uh, an opportunity for individual and unified um, dreaming. Okay, so now I have uh, have shared then that uh, that Ojigwanong prayer. I've told you that um, Dominic Koke very kindly uh, translated it, uh, the, 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 the core vision, the core words into text for us in French. And she, of course, has been coming to Grandfather Commander's gatherings for many years um, and brings a, 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 a different um, level to our understanding of what Algonquin identity is and the challenges that uh, our histories of colonization have imposed on indigenous peoples and uh, on our relationship with indigenous peoples. And so, um, mm, She's part of our larger circle, and thank you very much for your support of grandfather's work in this fashion. Grandfather William Commander, who is he? Well, on the wampum uh, belt carrier, the wampum heritage carrier of his Algonquin ancestors. He's an honorary PhD recipient. He's an officer of the Order of Canada, uh, but now he's also researched uh, um, uh, PhD, and uh, he said we must come together with one heart, one mind, one love, and one determination to create a circle of all nations, a culture of peace. There he holds the, the, the three-figure wampum belt, the sharing, the welcoming wampum belt, really the critically important wampum of our time, even though today we're really focusing on the messages of the seven fire prophecy. But here, the indigenous in the center draws together the hands of the newcomers. In this image, the French and the English, um, um, but in modern interpretations, the old settlers and the new settlers, the yeah, indigenous is always in the center. And agreed, they agreed, William Commander's ancestors agreed to share the grand natural resources and the land legal portions with the newcomers, but they did not really expect that their values would be overrun uh, and that they wouldn't have their rightful place uh, in this uh, agreement, in this relational agreement. It was a sacred agreement as signified by the symbol of the cross. And so grandfathers continued himself to hold out his hand in friendship to everybody but at the same time, it's time for, for all of us to, to really engage so much more seriously in a genuine understanding and respect to indigenous peoples or what they have shared with us and uh, how critically important um, their voices in the evolutionary path of, of people and Mother Earth. Uh, so key images that I like to rem remind us of, Grandfather Commander and our kindergarten dropout book, 
So bridging between different types of learning styles and knowledge and uh, with humility. Uh, I'm doing a prayer at the Landmines um, uh, Treaty uh, release. And again, the prayer for peace then rather than war. A prayer for sacred sites at Shaudia Victoria Island. And um, lifelong, life, lifelong learning. Uh, grandfather was very pleased to receive his honorary degree in the Western tradition, and uh, we are, we're working hard to bridge between all these various knowledge bases. Here you'll find like uh, the, the themes, the ideological themes of the Circle of Four Nations and Sustainable Relationship ideas, ideas and how we, uh, uh, the, uh, the, well, the ideological foundations behind these themes, and then the animative actions we've taken over the years, Grandfather Commander has taken over the years to make them real to us. Who is he? The carrier of the sacred wampum heritage, the renowned birch bark and canoe maker and craftsman, a politician, a political Algonquin leader, elder, chief, Chief of the North American Indian Nations Government, founder of the Circle of All Nations, a global eco peace community dedicated to advancing environmental stewardship and racial harmony. The Office of the Order of Canada, recipient of two honorary doctorate degrees, um, University of Ottawa Chancellor Ekar Jean created the Commander Hall in recognition of his relevance to the academic knowledge in 2014. And uh, he's now part of the uh, Canadian History Hall. He's, um, he's there in Up the Gardner, a historical publication. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, we're going into the 10th year since the passing of Grandfather Commander. And increasingly, people find his voice and knowledge important. And now, um, I'm moving on to our connection with some of the Circle of Four Nations friends, some of Grandfather William Commander's friends. And I shall now take a minute to go and video uh, call in three of our guests. And give me a second to figure out how to do this. Um, let me just check. Okay, Carolyn is there. Great, great. Ah, Luma, hello. Okay, so I see there are some people around, who are out there and who are, are making themselves visible and perhaps they'll join us and, and chat a little later. Um, but now let me go and find our special guests and let me give you a call. So, ah, there's Ramona. There she is. Hello. 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 Well, we were, we're, just, we were coming to try and grab you there for a minute. Oh, gosh, so you guys were. Figure... I, was, I was talking too much in the earlier portion, eh? <laughs> uh, so I don't know if you heard our, our conversation. Yet. No, yeah, because I, I was too busy talking. But let me just take a second to introduce you to, to our friends out there sure. and uh, here we have uh, 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 Kichi Makwa, Ron uh, Gosh, uh, Ron Goddard Poignier who uh, was uh, part of our effort to animate the stories of the land so many years ago, firekeeper at South March Island and uh, um, and also representative of the uh, Petit Nation people. And uh, we, we did a trip up uh, to Laximor a few years ago together when actually Ron said something that was very painful. Uh, and it stayed with me a long time. He, we, we were celebrating the launching of these two books by Jean-Guy Paquin. And uh, Ron's aunt had actually contributed a lot of information, photographs and things like that to the telling of the story of the 
um, original people of the Ottawa River watershed, this being one of the three primary, primary groups. And uh, because Ron also has mixed heritage uh, and was somewhat removed from the, 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 the identity as, as indigenous, as Algonquin, as First Nations, he said, you said, Ron, it's like genocide. It feels like genocide is being inflicted on me, um, that I am not able to embrace my culture and my heritage. And, and, and that is really um, the kind of uh, issue that is really, really so important for us to find new ways of addressing. So, um, but other than that, that was not the, the reason for this joint presentation. That's just a little bit about the background, a little bit about the uh, passionate sharing you brought to South March Island and lighting the fires there. Uh, but you were also the person who brought sweet grass braids to the pipe ceremonies that Grandfather Commander used to host at Saudi Victoria Island. Every June 21st, we bring bundles of sweetgrass braids, and we're always grateful for how you reclaimed your culture and heritage, and also how you shared it with, with people, including grandfather. But then along the way, you invited me to come to the land, and finally, actually after that grandfather died, I was able to join you. And that is when, by magic, I met Winnie, who was here from Denmark, and uh, also participating in your medicine teaching. And, um, and then thereafter, as some of our Circle of All Nations friends, Willie went to find the, um, the guy who had come and gotten grandfather to build a canoe in Denmark, a canoe hosted at the Roskilde uh, Museum. And she uh, uh, interviewed Jim Stanby, and I have actually had grandfather from his own home have a birthday conversations with this guy. So the relationship that they maintained while grandfather was alive and over really two, two decades, Winnie reignited. We've got a video, special video with those people, but she will tell us and Ron will tell us about how Ron Big Bear's Sweet grass uh, seeds have, uh, you know, found life elsewhere. And then finally, let me introduce Delfina, who's written this very special book about the turtle's dream, and since then has connected really uh, so much with our circle of all nations. And I want to say, especially why I have a part of this thing, other than the fact that all these guys are into nature and the connection with the the, the laws of life, laws of nature. But Delfina came to visit uh, a few years ago, and we went to the Quarry Trail right here in Canada. And we had a really, really special experience, an awakening in the context of your ancestors. And some of these Algonquin ancestors belong to the French River uh, portion of the landscape. So from, from uh, Ron in the east, moving towards the Great Lakes, uh, it's a really beautiful circle, and so I'm very grateful that you are joining me. And now I'm going to quieten down. Uh, people will see that I have this image here that, that shows the, the turtle dream, uh, the sweet grass uh, story written by one of uh, Big Bear's uh, friends about his work, and Winnie Seeds. And we'll just go over to you, Ron. Thank you. Big Witch. Um, Winnie, I, I have to say, that I don't know how, how better way to say that really blows my mind that those seeds that you had received many moons ago uh, from what your visit here when you came with Romola to the Sweetgrass Patch, you brought them there to Denmark you succeeded. There's not many, by the way, that succeeded in growing from seeds because it's a very hard process. If you don't follow the teachings that are given with it, then they won't grow, period. And and it blew my mind that, that those seeds that came from here went across the world, went to Denmark, and you were succeed, successful in growing 
the sweetgrass medicines, which, by the way, that medicine is meant for all four colors of the world. Well, more there's more in between colors in there, but basically, you know, I, I wanted to share that with you because in, in the teachings of the four winds, and that's one thing that I, I have a lot of teachings is in the four winds because that's what our medicine council is based on, the four winds and the medicine council. Um, the, when you look at the, 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 white pe the white color in the north, the white folks, the white people are very, very intelligent people. The thing is, is that as you know yourself, they, they lack certain wisdom to the animal world and that, and you found that wisdom. And it's smart, and it, it's very important to learn that. And, and for us, the red nation mixed with the white, um, I always, uh, this is a new term I've been giving to people, is we're the best of both worlds. And, and to learn that, that teaching of, of the, growing those medicines I mean, even for us to grow planters, I had uh, my last helper, he was a white person, a white guy, no native background, but he learned with me how to grow sweet grass planters, which we did give to a few people. And, um, and, and again, like with the seeds you have, uh, I remember a few years back, you sent me a picture of your, your, your little garden. And I found that so amazing to, to see that it just proves you that if you really want something, you can make it happen. So that's my my that's my say on that. Uh, Miigwech, thank you. It's, <laughs> it's it's an honor to to serve, but also when I see that, it, it more it makes me continue the culture, um, and it's it's the reason why I still continue doing things, even though sometimes uh, others will may not understand that, but then can't take the culture out of a person if that's who they are so you've proven to me that you know you can still do it and, and you're part of that medicine circle of the four winds which grandfather william commando knew about those himself and uh, it doesn't just represent uh, fire air water and earth it represents uh, <laughs> I would say there's about 21 layers, interlayers into the medicine circle that uh, I was able to incorporate with the medicines and everything, the animal world, uh, from humanity, et cetera, et cetera. But it was, I won't go into that in detail there. Um, but again, for you, Winnie, I am so proud of you. That, uh, there's only two other people, by the way, that were able to grow um, their own patch, put it that way and that they are sharing right now with other people. So uh, continue the good work. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> get tears in my eyes and I get really in touch. So, thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. Yeah. Yeah, so I remember the first time, I remember the first time I was uh, meeting, so to say, Sweetgrass, I was standing there with you and you, Romola, and the whole group out there in the middle of nowhere, so to say. And I remember that at one point you said that now we could go out and pick sweet grass, you know, off of tobacco and all that kind of things. And I thought to myself, but I don't know how they look. <laughs> you know, so I was standing there and I thought to myself, okay. I, I can't just stand here on my own and everyone is walking away. So I thought to myself, I must feel where to go. And then I began walking and I was really concentrating about how I felt and where to go. But my mind told me, you cannot be sure about that you can find sweet grass, you know. But I kept on walking and at one point, I felt that I should stand there, right here where I stood. And um, and I was waiting for you to come around. And then I asked you, oh, do you know what? Can you please show me how sweet grass they look? And if, you, if we can find some seeds, I really would love to bring some down to, the, to back with me to Denmark. And then you began laughing. And you, and you looked down and you pointed 
just where I was standing, I was standing in the middle of the sweet grass, who actually had seeds on them. So that was the kind of my first meeting with sweet grass out in nature, and it was a wonderful experience with you and you, Mola, and yours. Yeah, you. Really. And <laughs> yeah, and with respect to that, we don't really actually know without Facebook Live who's watching us whether these are really circle of all nations friends whether these are people who are familiar with grandfather commander uh but so perhaps we need to say that sweet grass is one of the four really important medicines for native people and you mentioned tobacco putting on the tobacco and then the land uh, allows you to accept and receive um earlier i had lit sage another one of the sacred uh, herbs and uh, cedar is the other one, uh, a powerful cleansing, healing medicine. So yeah, in that context, then the sweet grass is, is so very, very special and smells so amazingly beautiful. Uh, yeah. Um, shall we just uh, uh, have um, Delphina say a few words and then we'll go back because I know there are other things you guys will want to share. Uh, hi, Delfina. You're awake in BC. Hi, Ramon. What was that? I said you're awake in BC. It's good to see you. <laughs> you too? I just want to say, um, I just want to say miigwetch for Ramola for inviting us all together to come together today. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I really appreciate it to be in the circle and for, um, creating this to happen. I just want to say miigwetch. I also want to say that I'm on the traditional land right now of the Songhees and Lekwagen, uh traditional people here in British Columbia. So um, the blanket that you see behind me is done from an, an uh, Haida artist um, up north in BC. So I just wanted to just, um, affirm the land that I'm on right now. I've been here since, uh, well, I guess now for, I think it's about a year and a half, where I've been staying put. My, my staying put has been since September the 1st, 2019. This is so long for you. <laughs> Very unusual yeah, for you. Yeah. Huh? It, that's rather unusual for you because in that ancient uh, Algonquin way, it seems to me you circulate between BC and Arizona and Sudbury, Ontario, and you seem to be doing a regular movement but uh covid is keeping you yes. there now you know, from, from from you watching my journeys is uh you know yes you know uh, so where do i come from people ask me that especially when i travel because i do a lot of traveling and i was i was born in northern ontario um you know it's called sudbury ontario um i'm metis so my mother's line is Anishinaabe um, and Algonquin, combination of also Abenaki. And my father um, is Italian and maybe Spanish as well too, so on my, on my father's side. So there's a combination. And, but the, I find that there's, some, there's something that is a common, it's interesting walking in not just both worlds, in many worlds. Um, that I am being called, I am called, like Ron just had mentioned earlier, we got to talk, so lovely to meet both Ron and Minnie, to have a little bit of chit chat before we started, but okay. the calling to go somewhere is something that um, started happening to me in my teens, but um, I go from to right, northern Ontario to Quebec, you know, to me there's no border lines. And then I would go to Arizona, and then I would go to South America, and then come back. And people kept asking me, where do I come from? Right? And, and then, you know, especially when I spend time with uh, my Hopi grandmothers and Dene grandmothers, they're like, where are your people? Where do you come from? And tell me about your mother's line. Because they wanted to know, they said, the mother's line is very important. You're a traveler. You're a messenger. Right? So they were always asking me that. So. So anyway, so uh, I started to realize that because of everybody, everybody was asking me where I came from, and 
and what happened to me and where I was going, that I was telling stories, naturally. And I didn't, I'm like, people say, well, you're a storyteller. And I said, I'm a storyteller. I said, well, tell us what happened. And so I realized that I was actually telling stories. And I think what's happened since is this, this, this uh, uh, I guess because of, I carry in many, many rules is it's like, how did my, how did my book start? How does my art start? And how come when you do art and then you do stories and then you do dreaming and then you do music and, and I, and my thing is like, it's all connected. It's interconnected. All of it's interconnected. So I can't put me or it in a box. So, so I guess for me with that is like, how do I share this with people? And I, I realize that, you know, in the past where people traveled and shared stories, and how did they do that? Not in written form, but orally around the campfire. And then they would paint on pictographs and petroglyphs. So I realized when I was in places that had no internet, and in Arizona, you know, on the land, in or in the bush, there's, there's no internet. So when I started talking about certain things, the elders said, just share the story, the fire is on. So that's what I want to say is that the circle of nations in around the circle, I hope that this is what it is. So it's a, com um, com uh, it's a combination of many that, you know, where the dreams from the natural world. Well, so that's really interesting what you just said, you know, in terms of the stories and, and the, the dreams. And then the images and the petroglyphs and the pictographs, because really this is what we're uh, talking about uh, today. This kind of ideological foundation, really for all humans, but uh, some of us have lost the threads. And these are the threads that take us directly to nature. And, and so how do we reclaim our, our, our right to our stories, to sharing our stories and, and, and finding our place? How do we integrate, you know, like the, the, the dream messages? I know, uh, Delfina, you are very um, much alert to the energies of the earth because you're oftentimes uh, uh, send me a message to say you're feeling this way or that way, but you can feel an energy and we'll see something like an earthquake present or, you know, um, yes. And, and your connection too with the energies of the water creatures, you know, the dolphins and the, the whales and things like that. And yet you spend a fair amount of time in the desert. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's uh, very intriguing that land linkage and also uh, I, c I could put it out and maybe you'll say something more about this but you're also sort of like uh, deeply interested in interpreting the moon and the stars and the cosmic cycles from that kind of astrological perspective too so these are the things that have been part of the framing of your thinking well, it's interesting because when you had mentioned that today was the day that you wanted to, for all of us to get together, and I didn't know what the topic was, and when I found out that it's interesting, we have we have a combination that like it's almost like on the same the, the the track of the artists and the animal lovers, you know, the storytellers, and the nature connector. I'm like, we're in. It's like this is my tribe. Right, <laughs> just which usually is like, it's usually not, you know. It's usually it's like okay, we'll have this odd person that sees things, that <laughs> feels things, that goes where she goes, and you know, and you know, like my dad saying, you know, why don't you just want jewelry? Why do you want to connect with always with Deerfoot or something? Can't <laughs> normal. So I was like, oh my goodness, today we're starting off in Julian calendar 2021, which we know it's not really that it's not even the new year really it's like but what really got to me is that is like the topic that you chose is like the visionaries the ones that are connected to mother earth the ones who are connected to the animals and it is we're on the opening right now of the new moon 
this is the wolf moon. This is spirit moon. This is the moon that's very, very quiet. And I know you and I have a connection to wolf. And for me, this is a huge, huge confirmation. Last year, when I, you know, I've been staying put, I've been told to stay put in the West. <laughs> For no reason, just stay put, and, and you know what's happened, you know, to me in the past couple of years, and to, to be traveling and to be told stay put, you're not moving. I have to listen. Well, January the twenty fifth, which we're coming to that full circle right now. I happen to walk outside my door here. It's like okay, I'm going to go for a walk. It's it, it snowed, and in the city, I decide to go for a walk. And that's what, a little bit of what Winnie and, and Ron and I were talking about, the listening. I went, I had a craving for salmon. It was cold, it was snowy, it was beautiful, but then the snow had just stopped enough for me to go for a walk down the street. I had to be careful that I didn't slip and fall, because I had fallen earlier. Right? So I was like, slowly, walk slowly. Where am I going <laughs> with that walk in Kanata? I'm going to... The fisherman's shop. Everything is closed. The boats are closed. I'm looking for salmon. Why am I looking for salmon? I look for salmon. I buy the salmon at the one shop from the fisherman that's open. I turn around to go down the street, and I have. I can feel something. Something is there. Something is wild. Something is incredibly wild. And then my mind goes, well, what, what is it? And I went, I just feel like it. I think I remember how wild it was. So I turned around, and to my, and my instinct, I saw what looked like a large dog go down the street. And I was like, that's a very large dog. That's a really long tail. <laughs> it just goes by me, right? So then I go back around with my sound and I continue and I'm, then here it comes and I know, so people don't say, how do you know? I just don't know how I know. It's like the ancestors, the spirit, the spirit connection said, what do you think that was? And I went, that wasn't a dog, that was a wolf. <laughs> yeah, and your mind goes, how can a wolf be in the middle of the city, right? And I'm like, and then my other says, like, well, never mind about that. What happens when you have not listened to your intuition, your gut feeling? What has happened to you in your life? So that's when I went off track, or I, later on I'd be upset with myself because I knew it was the truth, even though everybody told me it wasn't the truth. Here I am with my sound in the moment. I turned around and I see the wolf. At that point, Takaya no longer is here in physical form, and I connected in Victoria. Right? That connection itself was surreal. I expected that to happen in the mountains, in the desert. So his anniversary is January the 25th, which is okay. just, so that's the wolf. It, he appeared here in the wolf moon. Yeah. So here it is. This is an absolute confirmation. And, and from mm -hmm. that, came the art, which I just want to share that. So, and what are we talking about? The wolf is the beginner. The wolf brings people together. It's the pack. Yeah, it's the, the bridge, bridge, bridge. You know, um, Delphine, sorry, uh, Delphina, you know the word in Algonquin for wolf is Mahinga. That's interesting because my name is Moegan Mo Kwek. <laughs> yes, and and of course, wolf is linked with the people of the Petty Nation as well. The the, the, the yes. wolf, end, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, and uh, wolf, of course, was uh, a particular special helper to Grandfather Commander. Uh, it's a long story, and I won't say all of it now. But when he was a child. Uh, and off on the trap lines with his father, Grandpa Alonzo sent him to go and check on the trap. And he went with his little dog, and all of a sudden, his dog hopped onto his snowshoes. He pushed him off. 
dog hopped back on. His grandfather stopped and then he looked and he found that he was surrounded by four giant dogs, he called them Timberwolves. And, and he held his dog because his dog was frightened. And, but he was just watching these uh, wolves. And eventually, uh, the, the lead wolf uh, lay back on his back on the snow, um, uh, twirled his paws into the sky, then got up, howled, and bounded off, and all the others went. And when Grandpa, uh, when he came back home and to the camp and asked and told his father about this, his father asked him how he felt. Was he frightened? And he wasn't. And that was really what Grandpa said. Grandpa Alonzo said, if you'd been afraid, the wolves would have attacked you. But Grandfather Commander was attracted to the majesty of the wolves. And so they really actually became his helper. And it's an interesting thing. One time, uh, some ceremonial people wanted to uh, dismiss grandfather's wolves. And, uh, and, and uh, after that ceremonial moment, you know, he'd been sleeping. And uh, the first thing he talked about was the wolf story. When grandfather commander died, I thought, well, now am I going to hear the wolves howl? I tell you what, we did his funeral at the, uh, in Manawaki, and we continued with his gathering because he died at the time of his uh, gathering in 2001. And we used to show videos as part of our teaching tools. And one video was created by this guy, and it's called Canada the Movie. And it starts off with the snow landscape and the wolves howl. And I started to laugh on grandfather's funeral because the wolves were affirming something to me about this relational thing. Okay, and, and, and so it, it, is, it is that <coughs> that I'm wanting folk at large to realize it's as close as that that we can learn to open the doors of connection, the communications with uh, nature. And so now let me ask you, Winnie. I'm going to uh, just sh um, show um, this clip here. Can I say something before you do it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I just want to say to you, um, to you, Ron, that the time we had that day where we went sweetgrass picking, and what you shared today, it really, really, really means a lot to me. And I'm so grateful for that you did it that day out in the forest that we were there drumming and teaching me about. The songs there, and and that we could have that good warm laugh together, and, and I'm very grateful for that I can be together with all of you today. So, and Mula, you setting it up and and being together here means a lot to me because it it feels like it's my people I'm with. So thank you for that. Yeah. So thank you. Okay, we're doing so wonderfully with technology, but that little uh, messenger window won't disappear from this little uh, thing that I'm showing. And really, one of the stories you'd wanted to talk about was this encounter with bird. And that's the image I've drawn up here. I don't know if you can see that. Your bird. When you... I can't see any images. No. You can't. I can only see the four of you. No. Oh... Okay, well, let me just um, close that one off and let me just allow you to speak to it because I shall have the links then for people at large to see. But, uh, but Winnie, you sent me a couple of uh, items that you wanted to talk about. One was your meeting with the bird. Um, do you recall? And uh, you stopped your car and you felt this little bird needed some attention and then eventually it flew away. And a little later, I'm going to show the, uh, a little section of your way of relating to nature. And then again, we, uh, you know, we can plant these links into the Facebook live video so people can go to them and then connect with you guys to learn more in, in the future. Likewise, Delfina, you sent me some photographs. 
that you could put into the chat line so that people will see it as a part of this uh, uh, Facebook Live. Okay. Okay. But do you want to talk about that? I mean, the reason that uh, we actually decided to move in this direction with this uh, January uh, Facebook Live was because uh, Winnie and I were talking, I think, at the time of the new moon or just before that. And you asked me what, what the moon means to me. And I didn't say this earlier in my presentation, but here's a little thing that I talked to somebody about the other day. Okay, so, and, and when I talked to somebody else about it, it was about the time of the full moon and they were feeling like edgy and, uh, you know, anxious and full of like raw energy. And I said, oh, wow, when I used to work in prison, we used to call that the orangutan time because all our inmates would be edgy and the emotional level, the energy level would be heightened and more challenging, more challenging for people to manage. And, um, and then I was saying, but like, look, we know, at least some of us know, that the moon is connected with the waters, with the tides, with the waves. Some of us know that uh, the moon is connected with uh, the planting of the seeds, the, the new, you know, growth patterns. We know moon is connected with uh, uh, spawning of fish. And, you know, Delphina said, well, this is the wolf moon. You know, we have these kinds of uh, ideas about the connection of the moon with Earth. So why would we not expect that the moon would also connect with us emotionally and energetically. And so I said, uh, I was saying to you, Winnie, what I do is organize my own work and planning around the moon cycle. So I say a new moon is a time for new beginnings. So it's the time to put in the seeds for the plans for the next while, the energies, the work I want to do. And in fact, that's what we're doing now. We're putting in the seeds for the Circle of All Nations work plan for this year with the dream, the ideological, the, 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 the kind of personal growth stuff that we want to see take us into understanding other issues over time. So at the beginning with the new moon is when I'm doing my planning. But by the full moon, it's time to think about how you're finishing off your cycle, you know, over the next few weeks. Are you finishing your projects? Are you, you know, getting on with them? And I'm thinking if people put some attention to that, maybe they'll feel less orangutan at full moon time because now they'll know the time is to not feel anxious about all the things you haven't done, but to get going so that you are doing your job just like the moon is doing her job, you know, and just like all those other cosmic elements are doing their job. So anyway, so it was really interesting that that is how we started um, organizing this. And then, you, you, do you want to talk about that bird experience or sh no? Winnie. Uh, I could do, can do, but I think that the main thing about the bird situation uh, that I felt what time I should leave my home and I felt that I should drive in a specific direction. And my GPS and my car told me to drive to another, to take another route. But I could feel inside that yes, my head can tell me something and my GPS, but I, I felt something was kind of pulling me in another direction. So I was you know, driving that direction I could feel a shift and then on a huge road by the side of the huge road a half meter away from the road from the side of the road I saw a bird and and, and I felt that uh, oh oops, just a moment here um so so I felt that what this that's weird something was wrong you know so I had to turn around my car and, and stop. And when I saw that bird, 
the bird looked at me with eyes so bright, so clear, just looking directly into me. And I could see that the bird was kind of, okay, I know you. I have already been reading you. And so the bird was relaxed. And I felt that I should walk over and I introduced myself, you know, although that I could see that this bird was reacting to who I am, just like all other animals are reacting to how we feel inside, who we are, and what are we here to learn from each other in that meeting and at our path. And it was very clear to me that this bird here and I, we have something we should do together. So again, I felt that this, there was a pool and I walked over and very gently, I was taking place by the side of the bird and the bird was just like, okay. <laughs> and I was touching it very gently and then I got that feeling from it that it was kind of, you know, I won't say shocked, but affected by being so close to the cars. So I had the feeling that I should very gently, after looking at the feathers and the body position and how the bird reacted to my movements and, and words, expressions, that I should take the, the bird very gently and move it a little bit. And the bird was, it was a seagull just looking at me like okay cool. looking down and i was walking with it and i was placing it very gently telling it okay, here here my friend can sit here and i might might be a good idea that i add here that if we are in doubt about if something is broken or something of course we must be aware of that the birds can feel pain and so so we shall not move them at that time except if it's necessarily I should have this but this year I just felt that it was okay I could feel it in my entire being and then I placed that bird there and I gave it healing because I could feel that it was needed and then I went back to my car because my brain told me maybe if this bird ain't ready to continue life and feel good and all that kind of stuff I must take responsibility and get some help about what to do, you know. My brain can tell me something and my heart can tell me another thing. Sometimes, you know. So when I came back from the car and wanted to walk over to the bird, I could feel again that the bird had had a good experience by being moved. And I could feel that the bird wanted to not sit in this position, but asked me to walk down to, I don't know what the word is in, in England, uh, in, in uh, English, but it's like walking down, walking up on the other side of the end. And I did that with that little bird there. And the bird was looking and just being with me and I was just breathing. And then I placed the bird down in the grass again and the bird looked up at me and it was like okay and i was getting a little bit of healing and i felt okay okay now it's time that i drank myself that much and then <laughs> then the bird looked at me and did like this with its wings like testing okay do they work and i saw that the legs they worked and then the bird began to fly and when the bird it took off. It did circles twice around, you know, around me. I'm looking down to me like, okay, thank you. And what I realized was with all the other birds around us, normally seagulls, they are pretty good at making sounds, you know, but they were so quiet. And this experience with this bird. What I really felt was, you know, that this bird was paying attention to who can I reach out there in the world, who are available for my calls, and my heart did answer. 
so I went with my heart and I had an experience with this with that animal there and it was like if I look at it and compare it to life our brain can judge so much you know and say right or wrong I must follow that track or I should do or I should but our heart is having an intelligence and that intelligence is worth listening to it sometimes it brings us to different road different experience but, you know we're here to learn and I think that one of the things I've learned the most from animals are that they carry wisdom. They are so tuned in. They use their senses. They are so present. And they are so aware and they are so able to read and, and you know, read us every signal from us. And, and all that, they use that as GPS signals to them, to their consciousness, so they can find their way. And, and I wish that, I really wish that we can um, honor them, honor them a lot more in human society. You do it a lot in your culture. I wish that we could do it a lot more in my culture too. And, and one of the things that the animals also have told me are that they are, you know, they are connected to each other. They are connected to the earth, to the trees, to different levels of, of smells from the trees uh, compared to what height they are in. And they have taught me so much. And one of the things they have taught me a lot about is enter into your heart and stay there, be there, use your head to live from your heart, so to say. And when we do that, we have another perspective compared to if we only use our head. And the moon, they are connected to the moon too. If you look at horses, for example, in Denmark, if you, sleep, if you, if you drive from home, you pass a group of horses, you know, all horses are at the same time of the day feeling the need for a nap. They are also following cycle, you know, the moon when they are ready to, you know, to do what, when they want children and so on. So the, so the animals, they follow nature and they sense what is the right. I heard of a man saying for a while ago, he said, Animals, they are so wise. When they feel tired, they rest. They feel it in the body when it's time. What people do is they drink a cup of coffee. <laughs> and it's, it's like, there's so many things we can learn from, from animals. And we are natural beings too. So what I really like to do is to study them. And from their reaction towards me, I also learn about where I am as a human being at the time, how they communicate to me telepathic, but also with the behavior that is telling me about them, but also what they sense about me. And what I explored is that sometimes they are actually more aware of how I feel than I am at the present moment. But if I expect something from them and get something different than I expect, I know it's not about that they misunderstand me. It's me who needs to pay more attention to what I'm saying now. So I guess that was, that was my story. Okay. Well, thank you very much for very, very You're more special. interconnected into it. Uh, I love animals. I love them. Mm -hmm. They are great teachers. Yeah. 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 Indeed, special. <clears throat> Just going to move a bit here. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> okay. So, we'll have uh, Ron and Davina add a few more lines. And then, uh, really, what I'm going to do once I finish the chat with you guys is I will show a little bit of your other image because then you'll be able to see it from just watching Facebook. And I, I won't be able to show the full 15-minute clip, 
but then people will get a sense of what you're talking about in terms of the energy connection, uh, the energies we bring to the earth and our, and, uh, and then uh, we'll perhaps uh, encourage them to learn a little bit more about what you're teaching. Uh, Delfina, you post some of your amazing paintings, you know, because they're just so fresh. They've got such an, a sense of like a child, child looking at the world and, uh, and sharing some of that. And of course, in terms of the, the animal thing, may I also just mention your son, uh, Yorel, who does these amazing uh, photographs of the real wild creatures uh, out there in the world, you know, uh, just recently tigers and tiger babies and things like that. Amazing, uh, uh, amazing uh, relational thing with mother earth and nature that he articulates and expresses in his art, but it seems like we're on our way. You can put his website down there too, so people can, you know, move. What we're hoping to do is really funnel a, a, a consciousness that becomes increasingly aware of these realities and these uh, uh, critical realities, really, because the earth is evolving and the earth has lost many species and we've been praying about them for quite a long time and grandfather and the Hopi since, you know, 1940s. But we've got to latch on and, and people need to learn to latch on at their own individual levels. And that's what's so special about your stories. It's just being aware and being alert. And we've suggested earlier ways that we can train ourselves to be more aware and more alert. And by drawing that rock, that's the first step in. Go ahead, Ron. Beautiful plant behind First you. There. Massive. Uh, I, I have a tree. <laughs> that, that's a tree. It's a real tree. Wow. I have a real tree in my apartment. Wow. It's beautiful. <laughs> that's it's... How, how my wife and I, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're interconnected here with the trees. See, gee whiz, how do you keep it looking so good? Because my... Well, she she trims it quite a bit, and actually, yeah, that 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 tree is also our Christmas tree. Okay. We don't we don't go cutting trees; we just throw lights in that tree. Yes. We've had that tree for 30, 34 years now. Wow! Wow! So uh, for for those thirty four years, we, we've been using it mostly also for the Christmas tree. So. You, you, a, I'll send you the picture of that with the lights on. Okay, beautiful. It looks like <laughs> but, a... uh, that tree is very, very special. Uh, I, I have a chair underneath it when I need to have a bit of, uh, when I can't go out there in the nature and I just need to relax, I go sit under that tree. Okay. And I let the energy join. You, you know uh, what? Absorb. Uh, something I want. Sorry? Go ahead. I'll ask you about that tree later because I need some okay. advice with mine. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, um, basically, uh, what Susie does do, she puts more earth, like she'll take some earth out uh, every year and put some new earth, so to give it more nutrition again, and it's a, it's a very happy tree. I watch the babies uh, form, like every time there's little baby leaves, um, uh, you know, that, that, that that's an inspiration tree to me. Earth basically is a, it's a tree that gives us a lot. That's nothing compared, look at here, I'm going to show you something. You, you won't believe this. My wife has such a green thumb. Here, here's some other of her plants. Yeah. Oh, wow. Plants. Wow, wow, wow. That, yeah. That's her other plants she has. That is amazing. Yeah, I, yeah. I used to have and, that. And in another the one here. There. Okay. A flare up. That's a big uh, fortune plant. Beautiful. And, and, and of course, her oregano. Oh yeah, we're 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 green. She's big and green. Big green. <laughs> green. And, and 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 all these plants in the morning when you get up, the air is very fresh in the apartment. So uh, it helps. Uh, uh, that's the filters of the earth, right? Yes. Um, what I wanted to share with uh, with especially Winnie because Winnie, uh, she experienced that place where we were going to pick sweet grass. That area is very special place that uh, brought the people to, and there's reasons uh, behind all that. Is that it's basically a corridor, 
and and of course as you're you're so interconnected with the animal world i don't know if you you romola and winnie if you noticed that that when you arrived at the spot there was a lot of birds a lot of animals and everything and before the women would drum the grandmothers and everybody when the ceremony started the animal world became part of us and everything gets quiet yes and they're in ceremony with us and that's every year every time we did that ceremony of the four winds it's every time that happens and i can vouch for that the grandmothers can vouch for that is that they're all interconnected and that's the special gift that was best to share with everybody and I think that's also what you felt over there, Winnie, is that interconnectedness of the animal world, which is part of us, and we are part of it, with the insects and everything. And, and that's what the elders are trying to teach everybody, is that world. And what best way to show people than to just bring them out there and experience it themselves. And that was the purpose of the Medicine Council, which I've spoken with the other grandmothers about. I said, now I know we can't do that no more, but, I, but they said, in those 19 years that we did bring people out there, that's what was shared out there, and the people learned that. And the ones that could come out, that was worth more than all the gold in the world, because you cannot get that type of classroom experience than when you go out there and experience it yourself. And that, and once we did finish with the ceremonies, then the animals, it's like they all lit up again. <laughs> they all became back alive. And, the, and of course, that's what you would feel when you, when you went there. And you were standing there, and I remember that day exactly like it was yesterday, yeah. that you were standing there looking for sweet grass, and I could feel it, that poor you, you felt so lost that you couldn't find the sweet grass. And that was the gift. And then, of course, we did that ceremony with the grandmothers, the drumming, and all the beautiful day. I always called it a day of culture. And, and, and the funny thing is, Romola, what you mentioned earlier about, you know, that I had lost my culture is because we were not taught the culture in this manner. This was something that had to be discovered by our own, on our own. And it's hard to explain this, but uh, you and Wendy have come out to that area, that very special area that, uh, I don't know, it's, again, like like you, like Wendy, she had to go out to go find her bird, uh, Delfina had to go find her wolf, and, and this was my calling, and that's what the term I keep emphasizing is the word calling, because it's a calling, and when you have that calling, just go and look, because there's a message out there for you, you know? And that was my own message, was by finding those areas. I, I know of other, other areas where I can go pick sweetgrass on my own. But that, that place where you went was the classroom. And the classroom is no more. But the, at least you've experienced it. And the, it was a pride to just go there, even when I used to go on my own. And, and I, there's, there's even one year my wife thought I was not crazy that uh, we had a big drought. There was no water that year. I even brought water 35 miles out there to keep the area wet. And I, I'd, I'd find an area where I, my brother used to live nearby. I could bring my containers and, and fill them up with water and spray that in the field, in the area, and just make sure everything was always wet. And we never lost that area because I, of that work that was done. But it was more of a calling to me, like, like for Winnie, her animals is more than just animals for her. Well, it's the medicine world and everything that's around that's interconnected. One thing I want to emphasize also, and, and I'm going to give you this here, Romola, for the moon, is that the reason why it's all like that for us is because we're partly made of water ourselves. And I was taught that a long time ago by the grandmothers, who are the ones that have the teachings of the moon, of Grandmother Moon. And, and the teachings they shared with me is that 
we're interconnected with her because of that water we're all made of. And, and like you said, because you've got part of the other answer is, is that when there's the tides and the different moon cycles, et cetera, et cetera, it does affect our, our changes. I can't even sleep properly in a full moon, neither can my wife, because of that attraction of the, the, the moon, you know, it's, and it's normal, it's, it's the way it is, so you're right, and what you just said earlier on the moon, you know, so, and, and of course, learning how to, to see the seeds, how to, you know, my, mo my mom always taught me, you know, there's certain times you don't do uh, uh, things, you know, you don't plant seeds, or you don't uh, water the garden uh, in the middle of the sun, you wait till night time, et cetera, et cetera, things like that, you know. Uh, she had the greatest respect of animals. Uh, sometimes I'd wonder, like, you know, why, why does she find this little field mouse and she's nurturing it back to life? I mean, farmers would kill them because they're rodents, but, you know, she had the respect of all animals. Uh, I even found a little white, uh, what do you call that, an albino pigeon. One time it had been hit by a car, it couldn't fly. And they're like, I can't believe it. it's going to die. So I brought it home. And of course, it, I had wrapped it in my coat, and it had made a mess in my coat. Of course, my mom wasn't too happy about that. <laughs> but we did nurture that pigeon back to life. We put it in the cage temporarily so it wouldn't hurt itself more. I fed it, you know, whatever I could figure out what needed to feed it. And once it was trying to, when he said with the bird, they're trying to fly away, and they're, oh, now it's ready, you know. It's, it's trying to exercise its wings. And I brought it out on the balcony in the, in the veranda, let it flap its wings a bit, and took off. You know, and it, like you said, it, it, they know they they thank you in your mind. You know, they thank you for their help. And this is the main thing I can say from my own experiences and the wisdom I've learned around the animal world is that um, the teaching we're taught is that we have to learn the simplicity around the animal world to understand them better so that when they're in turn needing our help, our help, the gratification we get in return is because of our knowledge of helping them, they will help us back by giving us, you know, because without animals, you're not happy in this world, seriously. It's not the material world that will make people happy. I mean, I've seen people coming out there why, why, you know, I, I kept asking people this. Why are you coming out there just to pick grass? <laughs> you know, to white, to, to, to standard white folks here around here or other cultures, they'll think we're crazy because they don't understand. But it's about learning that interconnectedness of the animal world, the insect world, the plant world, and all these worlds that are interconnected with humanity. And when we learn that simplicity, then, I don't know, I, I can go out there me and learn things, I mean, but it, it's, it's a classroom, even the one, the little bush across the street here, the things I've learned from it, uh, there's a couple of years back, uh, I remember bringing people there to pick sweet grass, there's a year we had the poison ivy. Well, one person caught the poison ivy, and I had a bit of native medicines written to counteract the, the, the oil there, what they call urush oil, which, uh, which you get from, you know, if you scratch. And I told the person, don't scratch, you're putting it in your skin. We'll put something on it and we'll stop it. And this medicine, which is jewel wheat, I don't know if you, uh, Delphina, I think, knows what that is, the jewel wheat. But that jewel wheat, it contradicts the oil of the poison ivy. So if ever you go back in the bush, that jewel wheat here anyways in this region, it grows around middle of July, up until August. And anytime I go in the bush, I'm going to put my tobacco down, grab a half a stem of jewel weed, and carry it with me because you never know when you're going to get poison ivy. I know how to identify it, but there's others sometimes that don't know, you know. And this stuff is real magic stuff. It's like a super aloe. And the plant will help you to neutralize that poison ivy itchiness. And, 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 and if people don't scratch it in, it will 
poison you into your or blister. So it, it does work, you know. So I just wanted to share that. Um, but basically, to, for for what I wanted to mention is that the place where Winnie and Lomola came to is too bad you weren't here in Ottawa in those days, Delphina, because you would have just it, it would have made your day. <laughs> uh, a few day, a few, uh, a few times we went out there with the grandmothers. I remember Dan Bernard was with me that day. That was crazy. That, that day was really crazy because being people of the deer, that's who the Westcarini people is. Dan was with me, and and I told Dan, I said, I I have a weird feeling we're going to see something special out there this time because you're here with me and here this is the only time you're here with me coming to the sweet grass field and sure enough there was three young does deer and he walked he walked towards them and they never ran away and i told him i said what does that prove you then that we are the people of the deer mm -hmm. yeah how much more we have, we, we have to emphasize on these things. It's just the way it works. It's simplicity. It's the way it works. And that's what I wanted to share. Because Winnie and you, Ramona, especially Winnie, I knew I knew she was lit up in there. I could feel her lit up in that area. It was very special that day for her. And coming from Denmark, I mean, I don't know if you feel things like that or if you've ever had an area like that. I call that a very special area. I mean, there's, how can I explain this? The grandmothers and I, we had a discussion about that area and they're called PowerPoints. And I'm not talking to your Microsoft. <laughs> I'm talking like, you know, special area. And there's only a few like that. Beaver Pond is one of them. The Beaver Pond area has what they call magnetite in the rocks. The, that magnetite is what they used to make gold boilers. And and this is what I tried to explain to people like to go I sent many people out there in the bush. And I said, I want you to go out there while we're doing the sacred fire. And I said, I want you to learn or to feel something out there and come back and tell me your experience. The one that hit me the most, and they all had the same feeling. Believe, believe it or not, I mean, there was thousands. I couldn't believe the people out there. There was thousands of people out there in Beaver Pond that came out that, that week and a half. That's you know, when uh, we were looking to protect an ancient uh, site at South Mark Highland. Site Forest. Yes. Yeah. And the people that would go out there, they'd come back and they'd say, we feel so at peace, we feel, you know. And, and this is what I told every person afterwards, is that because of the magnetite or the magnetism in the rock, and we're made of, of water, and we have uh, magnetism of our own, yes. you know, so it sorts of like binds us together because of the magnetism. But one, one group of people that really, um, how can I say this, uh, hit me, that's about the best way I can explain that, this couple had a child who had uh, ADD and whatever, and, and they said, every time we bring our child in here, he's at peace. And then there, well, that's amazing, you know? And it just shows you that some of these places that are like PowerPoints, I said, this is places you have to remember that first of all, you take creators for those places because they're put on earth here for a reason, for people to experience them. Just like when we brought people out to the, pick the sweet grass for them to learn the culture. Uh, I, I don't know if I had explained this to you, Winnie, at the time, uh, but the reason is, is people, when we brought people out there into that classroom, I call it, is because culture, and Delfina will know this is true, <clears throat> culture was going out the door. We were, we were losing culture, native car, native culture because of like all the things that happened here in Canada, which were not very pretty to the Aboriginal people. And, and, and that sort of relit everything back up, you know? So I just wanted to share that. that uh, the, the, it's very important for us to share. Like Delfina said earlier, she's, gonna, she's sharing with people, uh, you know, I think we lost Delfina. Okay, I hope we didn't because I <laughs> um, want to give her a word before we actually finish off because I've got a student I've got to talk to next. 
But thank you so much for sharing all okay. of that and reminding us about South March Island. And of course, it makes me think right away about sacred Shaudia Victoria Island, where we wanted people to mm -hmm. feel that kind of healing and energy. And we really do feel grandfather put many decades of hard prayer into that place together with others. And his dream was tossed aside by folk who didn't really, really understand it. And really, we're in a global crisis and grandfather commanded a global work to inspire us to reconnect with the land. So in what, in a sense, what we're doing here is like a virtual Asanabka vision. It's our virtual Asanabka Academy. And, and you know, we can have these kinds of conversations again and take more time to, to work our way through it because I think it's critically important for folk to see it like that. But Delphine, I'm gonna ask you to say a few words because then I'm gonna to have to go because I've got a student waiting to chat. Winnie, I'm not gonna show your thing immediately after. I'm gonna show it after my student, your teaching uh, clip, okay? Okay, hi Delphine, yes. can we give you a few minutes just to wrap up? I just went to plug, plug it in because it said low, low power, low power. So I was like, go run to get the plug in. Um, yeah, let me just say this. There's a couple of things that I they want, that just a couple of things I want to say is that when Juan just mentioned magnetite, something connected with me. Um, I've always been very connected with magnetite since, and since as I was a child. And that is an interesting point. Um, Pigeons have the largest amount of magnetite in their brain. And that is how they're able to tell about the, curv the curvature of the earth. That's why they fly they fly on an angle, right? Okay. And the Federation Aviation Agency have actually studied pigeons to find out what's happening when the curvature of the earth changes. So what's interesting for me is that I found out that whenever I felt a calling to go somewhere, um, I would just go and people would ask, ask or like, why do you do this? How do you do this? And I said, well, animals know how to do this. Uh, pigeons, that's why I have great respect for pigeons. Um, one quick story, I was in Tucson, Arizona. Um, this is a traditional land of the Pima and the Yaqui people. And I was in my car and I had a pigeon fly low over my windshield. And at that, and it was so low that I almost hit the pigeon, which is something I didn't want to do. And I had a moment of like, oh my goodness. And I decided on a, a split decision is to turn where the pigeon was going because it was so shocking. Um, so I followed the pigeon. I followed the pigeon to an area and I found out that's where the Yaki reservation was. Okay. Now, <laughs> this is how it works for me. I can't see for everybody. But when I did that, and I went, this is where the Yaki reservation is, but it's in the middle of the city. There's two of them. There's one on the outskirts on the land and one is in the city. But this was the oldest one before the colonization happened. And I was like, I went into the community center and I said, I don't know why I'm here. And it was like food time and they were feeding the grandmothers. And I said, um, I just had <laughs> this. But anyway, I just, I had this crazy thing that just happened with the pigeon. You know, you, so you sound like you're a crazy woman, right? When this happens, so they're feeding the grandmothers. And they, and I said, well, I don't know. I said, maybe I need to meet somebody. And they just said, oh, you might want to speak to Maria. Right? So I was like, well, where does Maria live, right? Well, she's two blocks down over here, and just go to her and just tell her that we sent you. So anyway, I walk on the door, and you're like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to go and just knock on the grandmother's door. So I knock on the grandmother's door, and I ask to speak to see if the grandmother called, well, I call Maria. And uh, so the daughter says, yeah, this is my mother, Maria. She looks at me, and then, she, and then I said, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> But I said, I just had this experience with the pigeon, and then she looks at me, and then she said, tell me about about you. Where do you come from? And I went, so that question was like, all the way, okay, I come from the land, and, you know, the Ottawa Valley, and my family is all Gonquin, and, you know, I was like, she said, 
come and have tea. <laughs> well, I read to her Turtle's Dream, which was the dream that I had on Four Corners in Arizona in 2009 that became a book in 2010. When I told her the dream, told her the story, told her, and then she wanted to know <clears throat> after that, and then wanted to know my other dream that was not in the book, so she already knew. I told her it was the second part of the dream that her father had had, who had passed on. And it talked about changes of the earth. And it talked about the animals coming. And uh, lo and behold, I'll end up staying a week with the grandmother. <laughs> a uh, pigeon. Uh, and a lowly pigeon is... It sent you on your path. ...universe into the cosmos. So my stories, the art, the storytelling, comes from the ancestors, comes come from Sky Woman. Sky Woman gives us instructions. Each and every person has original instructions that we were given. And they're guided through dreams, they're guided through encounters, which then we need to share, and then that is shared through storytelling and art and whatever way, and now we're doing it through this technological Aquarius connection. So, <laughs> well, 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 pretty, pretty amazing, pretty special, and... It just to tie it all together, you know, that that is the journey and the canoe took us to, to, to Denmark and brought us back uh, to uh, enliven the, the, the journey, the canoe, the story of life image. The PowerPoints that you're talking about, my goodness, Delphina came to one of my PowerPoints, the Quarry Trail, Trail the Centenaire, and uh, uh, was a magical moment in terms of even the land acknowledging you. So we'll have to carry on with more of these conversations at another point. Thank you guys so very, very much for uh, joining me for our very first uh, Facebook Live. Thanks Facebook for allowing us to do a global online gathering for whoever is interested. And I have to say, I was rather surprised that uh, with all our efforts during the last year when we were practicing the technology and stuff like that, we actually had thousands of people. I don't want to say quite how many thousands, but quite a few, I was shocked, who have followed us either during the actual live events or uh, by, by watching later, or at least being aware that this kind of discussion, this time, kind of conversation is happening. So thank you so much for, Anthony. Uh, one on. sec. OK, one sec, because I'm like kind of late. OK, go ahead. It's just I did forget to say that at my Facebook page, Tuesday night at 19 uh, o'clock Danish time, I share videos about uh, what people can do if they would like to add healing to Mother Earth or animals. And I guide them okay. through it and, and what I have explored. It's good to know. I just want to know to say that. Okay. You know what you could do? When you when we finish off here, you can just join my chat, and you can add the you know the 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 link to your Facebook page. You can write a message about that, so people will be able to track you and follow you. So you too, Delphina. Okay. So great. So thanks for sharing that. We'll do your little clip a little later. I'm going to say goodbye, and but pay attention right immediately after. I'm going to show another photo image on my PowerPoint that ties in with exactly what we're talking about from kind of like my perspective. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you so very much. Miigwech, Miigwech. 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 <laughs> nice seeing everybody. Okay. Yeah, you too, everybody. Goodbye. Okay, to my PowerPoint. Bye. Bye. Um, wow, so let me just now hope that you're all here with us still and let me uh, go to this image on the PowerPoint and here's what I wanted to, 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 to share um, this is a, a special I consider it an ancestor rock really in the the, the quarry tale that uh, Delfina and I walked in, and I 
love that rock and I sometimes lie on it and, uh, you know, just see what it's going to tell me or teach me. And I've taken probably hundreds of photographs of it. And on this particular day, it let me see an eye. So I just thought that was so intriguing. Uh, I don't really know why. Um, but there you go. There's energy in rock. There's energy, the rocks, the native, native people talk about them as the grandfathers, the, the oldest creation of Mother Earth. And of course, now research uh, on, uh, on the creation of mountains and things like that affirm that a li a rocks are not inanimate. They have life and they grow. And we'll talk about that at some other session. I'd just like to show you this though, while I'm, uh, while I'm talking about rocks. Here's an egg rock that we brought to grandfather. It's from Australia. Pretty magic, pretty magical. The next picture is, is of a bird that banged itself on my window and fell down below and I went racing out and I did all sorts of things to sort of rescue it and it, it seemed conked out for quite a while. Uh, I did smoke ceremony, I did a lot of things besides, you know, taking my face cloth and keeping it warm and all of that. And the picture below, it's hard for you to see in this small image, but right about there, you know, when it eventually took off, it didn't take off like many other birds that I normally see, but there was just a sudden burst of light, a burst of an orb as it evolved into energy. It was so magical. And this little guy came to me, came to my windowsill, and I thought, well, my goodness, what is this? And when I looked at it carefully, I realized that it had um, spider web all over its beak and it couldn't remove it. So it came to me to have the, 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 the sticky stuff removed from its face and its eyes and its beak, and then it went off. So, you know, that relational thing, you don't have to be really a magical person. You don't have to, you just really need to be alert to nature and nature is already always has her eye on us. Okay, so now I'm moving on to our student and I hope uh, Dilara is still here. So now we basically, you know, as I said, we're trying to link between circle and uh, um, first. Um, Lara, come on. This is going so slow now all of a sudden. This, uh... Anyway, she's not just popping up. Maybe this find easier. Excuse me, people, while I try to reach Lara. But uh, Delara, if you uh, uh, can hear me, please contact me then. Please. Because for some reason, a messenger is working very slowly right now.
and it's not presenting. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have her. So Lara is a student at Carlton University who has uh, done a little bit of work with us at Circle of All Nations. Who's this now? <laughs> She's trying to call me. Hello? Lara? Hello? It's not good. Let's see if that works. Okay. Sorry, folk. Uh, take a bathroom break. And we shall hope to get Lara on. But other than doing a little bit of work with us uh, regarding our Circle of All Nations files, she's been part of our work with our course on oh, Circle of All Nations book. Okay, so sorry for one thing that I'm so late. Uh, but I hope you've been uh, following our conversation. Yes, I was here. And uh, here you are. Now is your moment uh, to share with us. And I was starting off by uh, showing folk that you were part of our Circle of All Nations Learning from a Kindergarten Dropout trial course over the last uh, yeah. winter. And uh, you've... Uh, uh, done amazing things with the stories and the issues that we've analyzed. Today we've talking about dream and storytelling, as you know, but we've also hit a lot of heavy issues like racism, like, uh, you know, abuse of women, murdered and missing women, the criminal justice system. We've talked about a lot of heavy duty issues in the course of our course. And you mm -hmm. have taken some of those uh, um, stories and transformed them into amazing artwork. So folk have already probably seen this one. Dilara, can you tell us a little bit about this? We are not all equal. Yeah. Um, should I show it? Uh, I think I'm showing sure yeah, Oh, yeah. If you can show it, show it. Go ahead. Because, uh, because I can't see the, the live screen. I'm only on, on your chat right okay, now. Okay, okay. So I got it here. It's okay. A big thing. I got it here. Right. So um, how I started it was, I think it was the chapter we were talking about, um, well, racism in general, and especially racism towards the the um, North American indigenous people. And the same day I got refused, um, I got rejected for a scholarship from my school for the second time. And like those two um, merged and, you know, I really felt like I could personally um, um, feel what those people were feeling for years. I mean, not necessarily that maybe we're not having the same things, but I felt like um, what non-direct racism is like you know, you're giving, you're told that you have so many opportunities, but how do you get to them? How do you reach them? Are they giving them to you when you reach out to them? You know, and um, 
anyway, I it just just there was a lot that was um, going on in my head, and I thought we're not all equal. We're just we're trying to be. We're told that we're all equal, but unfortunately, we're not all treated. We're not all equal. We're not treated equal. We're not seen as equals. We're not thought of as equals, and we're not taught to people as to each other as equals. So there's it's probably the most like um, I w I want to say that for. First of all, before I show the other paintings, I feel like there are reasons um, we do certain things. There are reasons we journal, there are reasons we paint, there are reasons we go for walks. And um, if I could explain every painting by words, I wouldn't have painted it. I would have write about, well, written about it. I believe that colors have their own language. I believe that our body has their own language. I believe that words obviously have their own language. But linguistics are just one of those language capacities we have. And, you know, the reason I painted this is for you to look and understand, not... I, I can't explain everything about it to you because the reason I painted it, because I can't talk about it. That's, that's the reason I painted it. So... The most job is um, like looking, you know, I can't tell you like word by word what it's about. It's basically about frustration. It's about um, feeling like feeling hopeless, feeling like you're going to lose it because you're trying so hard. You're working so hard every day, but you're just not getting where you want to get. You know, it's, it's like hard, hard work doesn't always pay off. It feels unequal. So that's basically the, the philosophy behind we're not all equal. And I gifted it to Circle of All Nations. It was uh, one of my, it was a big inspiration behind it. Thank you. And, and you know, uh, you presented that round about the time when uh, Black Lives Matter, when there was a lot of that kind of violence and killing happening. Mm -hmm. But we were also mm -hmm. super conscious of the environmental uh, extremes that we were experiencing. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, that uh, image was as much the cry of nature for the loss of mm -hmm. all the species, the species that are just marching on and leaving us, you know. So we really are at mm -hmm. like dramatic times and that image captured so much. And the reason why uh, I'm so grateful to have it as part of our, our circle repertoire is precisely because of what you're saying that we can't learn everything through words. We can't, uh, mm -hmm. of course, we're like really handicapped here because we can't talk Algonquin, which we ought to as William's land of his ancestors and the land, the language of the land. We can't talk French efficiently. Je parle beaucoup le français, mais pas bien. Donc c'est difficile de partager renseignement très important avec uh, not for me and our lo uh, lots of our friends are French so I know there's a deficit there but but then with the image you reach us at other places and we're wanting to say that knowledge is generated knowledge is created through a variety of means and it's relevant at multiple levels and how can we equalize learning through a variety of streams and from so that in this time of crisis, we can learn to bridge better and create, like, you know, a future for all. But especially for young people like you, because I've said before, 9-11 has brought a huge degree of insecurity into to, to your lives, over and above the insecurities that we all have. South African burdens, you've talked about Turkey, we've talked about things like that. Mm -hmm. But now we not only have 9-11 in our recent experience, we have the pandemic. And I have to say, though it's not the discussion for today, I was rather shocked to realize that uh, foreign students such as yourself pay like 14,000 in tuition mm -hmm. for one school term. And given my goodness that you do that, we ought not to be seeing the kind of racism and hostility that we actually see mm -hmm. on campuses uh, across Canada, something has to shift with a lot of that reality. And uh, and so hopefully efforts like our sharing here will, will enable a better bridging and a better process really of like educating and stimulating all our minds, you know, to create a, 
uh, a society that's meaningful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. With that uh, thing, let us now go to your other images. And I've got them up on my PowerPoint as well, but you please show. Um, I can go with the next one. So this wasn't long after. This was the era I was the most productive. It was like the beginning of um, kind of like August, I think. I, I, I was, no, July, we were working together. And um, this is called A Suppressed Woman. It's a tiny painting. Okay. And, well, I, I, I first had a, again, color goal. I just wanted to use two colors, blue and red, and black and white, obviously, as like a, um, as a challenge. But then, like I told you before, um, when you start journaling, things just come up, right? You tell me that always. You're going to get into a flow well when you're drawing like and you're not even gonna know where you're ending same with painting i feel like i just started with colors and ended up here i didn't even expect to have a sad face i expected to have a face but not this face with this technique with all these um with this mixture of colors but at the end it was like talking to myself on my canvas i was like oh that's what i'm feeling that's obviously that's what i'm feeling and i have to use um colors to journal anyway so here, this is um, obviously um, a, a face that is really sad and beaten up, has some wounds around it. And you can probably see it in your screen. I can't see your screen, but um, well, I say a woman here because um, around these times, uh, the femicides in my country, in Turkey, were rapidly rising and I was feeling like really really depressed about around that time and there was the I was working with you guys I was realizing how much we're not we're doing the exact same things like like the way people someone abuses a woman doesn't look much different than someone abusing a nature to me it's both ignorant it's both insecure and it's both it's both um unacceptable and well, we say Mother Earth. I'm not trying to give the nature a gender here. I'm just trying to say that I feel like there is a very, um, it's very parallel to each other. Harming Mother Earth, is, um, cutting a tree that you're not supposed to, where you can go around a tree, you don't have to cut it, but you're cutting it anyway. Because why? Because you don't know. You don't know that you can go around. You're ignorant. Or because you have other issues you haven't resolved. So you just want to harm things. You want to damage things. You want to get that energy out. Also coming from ignorance. And if you want to harm a woman, you're very ignorant, first of all. And second of all, you are, you're discriminating. You're in a way a discriminating person. You're sexist here. And I feel like sexism, racism, homophobia, they're all just coming from the same place. As same as harming nature discriminating nature from our lives so i here i wanted to show that um this damage is in the body but it is also in um mother nature it, hurting a body is nothing different than hurting nature hurting nature is nothing different than hurting a body so i wanted to do a metaphor here with those two ideas and again i'm limited in uh, it's it's limited how much i can tell you you have to look at it and be like okay i get it or i don't get it <laughs> And there's this one. Um, I picked this one through for today. Mm -hmm. Oh, so much light. Yeah, this one's called the third party. There's a little light bulb up there. Mm -hmm. And there's a person there, and it's in a dark place. So this is about um, self-empathy, self-compassion, and bystanding. Um, I wanted to show here as third party that um, this was the week we were talking about, again, something about racism and how much um, uh, um, there is drug abuse, um, that indigenous people end up, um, like, um, substance abuse disorder, they end up developing due to social reasons, and how many people are remaining unemployed, how many people don't have opportunities to go to school or get work because of um, just being indigenous and i was just thinking like how what about the other people who are not indigenous like what are they doing about this and i feel like this is such a huge issue it cannot be not seen impossible it's it's just it's such a huge issue that um 
you can't something you can't just keep walking but we yeah we do we, we do keep walking we do keep bystanding things and i felt like how do we stop this i feel like before we teach people about the facts we should teach them about self-compassion and self-understanding self-empathy give them a chance to step out of their own body and look at themselves in that situation what do you look like when you're walking away from a problem because it's very embarrassing for you you're somebody that is facing a problem right there at the moment and you're just walking away it makes you look i, I don't think you deserve to look like that first of all because um Again, it's a type of ignorance. If you look at yourself from, if you had opportunity, if you had the knowledge to look at yourself from the outside, I, I bet a lot of people would change, it, change, change their minds because we we do feel a lot about ourselves. We, it's an instinct to be care about ourselves. We eat for a reason, we sleep for a reason, we have tendencies to do things for a reason. And I feel like uh, one of those in, in, empathy is an instinct we can develop, I feel like. And yeah, that's why, um, when you're in darkness like this and there's an abuse here the only way to go is to the light if you went anywhere else you go is the darkness if you want to get to the light you have to go to the problem right there which is right there just very obvious and if you're the third party like from where you guys are standing um you should take yourself you're here to where you guys are standing and look at yourself in the scene that's basically um what this is about Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh... And yeah, it's inspired by our um, both our um, our lecture on on those topics and something personal I, I experienced. I don't want to I don't want to bring it up right now. It's a bit tragic, but I feel like we in the world. I don't want to bring it on here too. So well, well, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you for that. And I mean, I remember those psych uh, uh, textbooks from when I went to university a million years ago and they talked about just exactly that last issue you raised you know how something could be happening to somebody and then when many people were around they wouldn't intervene uh, and and so there's something that is wrong about our group reaction our institutionalized reaction to a lot of things so you're absolutely right this throws the light on us as individuals and how we're in, in interacting with any one item. And with the bigger theme of our work today, which is really critically, we have to go through the self-reflection first. We really have to know ourselves and our strengths and our shortcomings. And, and the better we know ourselves, the better we, we won't be able to duck out of things like this. And that's how we will shift culture. And obviously, um, the crisis that is now uh, emanating in the United States has brought, like, you know, the global issues right back home. Because for so long, this seemed like such a privileged part of the world, North America. But North America, even yet, is not looking at itself in the face. And it needs to look. Otherwise, it's only going to be playing around in the dark. And so it's like, yeah, critically, critically important that that happens. So then, OK, so um, you've shared uh, that in um, in amazing images. And I did include some of your text in the PowerPoint presentation where you'd written a few words about the suppressed woman and the third party. Um, do you have the text of your reflection on on the, your engagement of the Circle of All Nations work? We, can, um, the email I wrote you? Yes. And I wonder if you'd yeah, mind reading it to us. Sure. Yeah. And, and in part, it's because it's an affirmation of what I know at my gut level to be so important that we really need in the academic world to be understanding what uh, the Circle of All Nations work and what the grandfather legacy is all about in order to advance our thinking, advance our knowledge, and uh, to have a student like you 
react to really three different uh, areas of our work, our Facebook posts in our community, our actual learning from a kindergarten dropout course, and from the ongoing William Commander presence and influence was very moving for me. So please go ahead. Okay. Um, it was your birthday email. Oh, okay. Uh, celebrating your birthday. <laughs> um, I'm sorry for happy birthday, Romolo. I'm sorry for celebrating it late. I had should I skip these words or <laughs> no? Go um, go for it because you know actually it gives me a give a moment to explain my birthday too, right? Because you see, all my Facebook work is related to the Circle of All Nations and the Grandfather Commander. The Nature Can Teach, the Asanabka work. So I do five pages to focus on the various aspects of our topics to reach many people. And my birthday, you know, as of nowadays, it's pretty private with Facebook and Messenger. But Karen, uh, who's like a loyal supporter of our work, who keeps our Asanabka website going, who actually did the, uh, the little uh, video clip that started us off today, the grandfather drumming. She did it for me this morning so that I would be able to include it here. That's how Circle of All Nations folk work, like they work like that. And we're all unfunded, unpaid, whatever. But she posted the birthday image and then it, it circulated on Facebook. But actually it was really, really great because we were, I was able to have a Facebook party with colleagues and friends from so many different places. And to show that, you know, our work is real. I'm glad to celebrate my birthday. I'm glad you're now part of my birthday celebrations. But it also generates that sense of community, that Circle of All Nations community. And, and uh, yeah, so it was, thank everybody for their greetings. It was very special. I took the limelight of Grandfather Commander for a change uh, for a few days. But of course, we know this work is emerging from his energy. So please go ahead. Uh, I had deleted Facebook from my phone due to lack of storage space. And I saw it just now that it was your birthday. I hope you have a wonderful new age with lots of lots to learn. I want to take this time to let you know how much you have taught me in such a little amount of time. We have known each other. I acknowledge that I can be a bit disorganized to communicate with, with in this period. But your patience and under, uh, understanding was really one of the things that made me feel supported in this difficult time not everyone has the manner you have Th and thanks to you i got to meet circle of all nations which taught me more than i could type down here it changed my whole world view to read all the memories you guys have had all around the world although it was tough to have to accept and confront that there are so many people in the world living in such difficult stand Standards. Circle of All Nations reports left a, a impact, um, a different impact in me compared to the world news that I purposefully choose to avoid in this per period. In contrast to the world news, Circle of All Nations reports always had a happy ending. Unlike the news, despite the tragic information I had to fuel up within the beginning of the reports, I always moved on being satisfied with the information I had just confronted. Thank you for that. I got to keep up with the world, yet not to get scarred by doing so. <laughs> on the other hand, introducing me to uh, the Circle of All Nations 101 lecture group has been a blast for real. This is the, the book group we had. It is a time I feel quite. Well, it was the time. I, it is a time I feel quite lonely and have to meet. And having to meet you guys every other week was very exciting. Plus, having an excuse to reflect on what we have read has been very beneficial for me. Uh, though I couldn't do it very well every time, it felt so good. I wanted to do it again. I wish we could keep up the group with the same tempo as last year, but I guess everyone got busier this year. I actually have five courses instead of four this time. But meeting you guys every month will, will, will still benefit me so much. I'm not even aware of all that I'm learning from all of you guys. Meeting William Commanda in your book was absolutely vital for my future self. I think I have already expressed in my previous reflections how I feel about this work, his works and your adventures. But there's another thing about him that him inspired me that I don't really know how to explain. One thing is to know what to know that there are people like him and you out there makes me feel hopeful, especially at times I get pessimistic about my goals. Another thing 
I think another thing I think has to do with the respect and admiration I have attained for the indigenous culture of Turtle Island. I don't know how to back this up enough, but maybe I will paint it sometime. Also, before I forget it, if it wasn't for if it wasn't for your book, I wouldn't have gotten to paint We Are All Equal, which still remains as the most emotional work I've done. I got to discover the direct communication of colors and emotions with that painting. Also, I feel like my increased attention towards nature was was influenced by listening to you. Your references, you, you, you reference nature frequently in your speech, but I think there is the energy exchange of some sort that you have with the people you communicate that reminds the holiness of Mother Earth. I could go on and on, but I don't want to bore you with long message. Perhaps we can have a meeting on the weekend or catch up or anytime you're available or tonight after the, the Global Nations meet, meeting. Okay. Take care, have birthday. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much. That's very, very special. I, um, and, uh, you know, I mean, um, it does focus a little bit on me. So I appreciate that. I value that. And at the same time, you know, it's kind of nice for me to share it publicly because sometimes uh, people wonder, you know, who is this Romola? And what is this connection yeah. with William Commander? <laughs> and I'm yeah. definitely the wrong kind of Indian. And I'm definitely, as you know, not a proper academic. And, uh, you know, there's so... You're so, a free spirit. I'm a free, You're a bit of everything. A bit of everything. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. So do you have anything else you'd like to share? Or shall we... Um... Well, that was about, like, my whole experience summed up with the Circle of All Nations. I'm really, um, I'm really, I feel really lucky, first of all. Like, I mean, it's not luck. Probably there's reasons we met each other, but... Yeah, I feel very fortunate that I got to meet you and I got to work for Circle of All Nations. And yeah, that's that's about it. I recommend it to everyone. <laughs> okay. And in the meanwhile, go tracking Beaver. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a while. I'll, I'll see him tonight, maybe. Okay. Good. Take care. Thank you so much for waiting and joining. Bye. And Okay, so that was Dilara. Now let me go back to uh, the tail end of our PowerPoint presentation. I've shown you this uh, before. This is the uh, Circle of All Nations landing site done by another one of our special students, another uh, international student. Uh, April comes from China. And she helped uh, helped us put together this landing page, which takes us to the new Circle of All Nations work, where we're linking our academic work with our old websites. And as you know, I'm eternally grateful to Karen, who maintains our Asanabka website, where all our Circle of All Nations activities uh, and reports of the last several years are lodged. So even though the Circle of All Nations new website is still not yet up. You, you won't have missed a beat in terms of the information because Karen has kept this site fully updated with all our reports, uh, including our important reports of this last year, the one on Isaias, the storm that came on the anniversary of grandfather's death when he says, uh, said before he died, they gave him that name, Isaias. And also the, the paper that we did on coronavirus and the isolation, we wrote that before uh, the uh, emergence of the real um, frightening pandemic that we are now dealing with almost eight months later. And you'll find both those reports up there. You'll find uh, um, other things, uh, our colleague Lindsay Lambert presented an argument regarding the uh, Shaudia Victoria Island site and the land land issues, the legal legal issues pertaining to land ownership. Of course, you've heard many of us talk about things like that uh, Ron Goddard uh, Fournier describes as power points. And yes, Shaudia Victoria Island is an important energy point for many, many of us. And as a matter of fact, even right now, uh, colleagues from uh, Massachusetts uh, are tracking sacred sites, important energy sites, 
We've heard a little bit of discussion from our friends about the rocks, the 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 uh, the the pigeons, the the voices of nature that are alert to these things. So we hope that this will help broaden our base of understanding. And in 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 essence, in 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 this logo, uh, uh, this landing page, we will be blogging on our new circle work. Our Facebook pages, we consider our moment in time uh, uh, cybernetic steering guiding pages where we're wanting to funnel uh, an ongoing attention to the grandfather William Commander work and legacy. And uh, we're grateful that Facebook enables us to do these uh, sessions free and live and share with whoever's interested and keep them on. And um, and then eventually we shall have a cyber cartographic atlas, which will map grandfather's travels on many of these PowerPoints, these sacred spots, and other important places to him in the North American landscape and elsewhere, where he built Circle of All Nations. And uh, I'm grateful to Carlton University, to my professor, uh, Dr. Fraser Taylor, and his team at the Geomatics and Cartographic Research Center for supporting so much of my research and study and uh, efforts, even though it doesn't fit in so smoothly with the, the style of universities, but it's enabled me to uh, go a long way to understand academic writing and articulating our grassroots work in that fashion. And I should just point out to you that I actually also have done